Well, welcome everyone to our School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs in Action seminar, which is um, also my environmental policy and yeah, intro to environmental, environmental science and policy classroom. Um, tonight, um, I'm delighted to introduce a panel to talk to us about what I had originally pegged as citizen science um, which have since been um, informed that it's probably better to talk about community science, and I'm sure that's going to come up tonight as well. Um, we have a very interesting panel that talks about different aspects of this. We're going to start out with Ms. Rianne Gibson. Um, she is at Conservation Law Foundation, where she's the Venture Senior Research Fellow. She manages the Healthy Neighborhood Study, which we're going to be hearing about tonight. She's done community organizing with the MAPAN Food and Fitness Coalition and in Lewiston, Maine. She has previously worked in community-based research and evaluation at the Institute of Community Health and at a Boston University study focused on treatment for alcohol use disorder. Her research interests include health disparities, particularly those related to community health in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods. Ms. Margaret G Gordon is a lifetime uh, community activist. She's a founding member of the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, which is a resident-led community-based environmental justice organization. In 2007, she was appointed to the Oakland Port Commission, where until 2012, she promoted the interest of community health, workers' health, and fiscal responsibility in the port operations. In 2010, she won the National Purpose Prize, and she was honored by the Obama White House as a champion of change in 2013. Following her, um, and still part of the same uh, California con 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 um, convention, is Ozuboke uh, Akaba, who is a senior public information officer at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. He has been an environmental policy analyst for Public Health Institute, um, and he can tell us a little bit more about that organization. He served as an advisor to the California Air Resource Board and as a technical assistant for the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, about which he will be speaking tonight. He was the director of the National Technical Assistance Program for Communities for a Better Environment and provide scientific and technical expertise to community groups addressing industrial pollution um, and has led many other campaigns. And David Sittenfeld, who is the manager of the forum program at the Museum of Science, which engages citizens, policymakers, and scientists in conver conversations around emerging, emerging scientific and technological issues. He regularly gives talks, on topics in current science and technology at the museum, delivers demonstrations in the exhibit halls, and manages special programs and exhibit projects. He's a member of the Executive Committee for Expert and Citizen Assessment of Science and Technology, and has served on the Program for uh, Committee for the Nanoscale Informal Science Education Network. Um, he is also a just finishing, I think, his dissertation defense and uh, for his PhD in, the, in, in our school. So uh, thank you all for attending and we will start uh, with Ms. Rianne Gibson. Thanks, Joan. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me fine. Um, I'm gonna share my screen right now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about my work on the Healthy Neighborhood Study, um, and it's a participatory action research project, which I'll talk a little bit about it, but it's um, pretty adjacent to citizen science, um, but it's also a little bit different. Uh, so a little bit about me, Joan already gave a wonderful introduction, um, but I'm a senior research fellow at the Conservation Law Foundation. Uh, my background is in public health, uh, so focused on health equity and the social determinants of health in particular. Um, and I, I have historically worked at the intersection of like research and organizing. So I actually started on this healthy neighborhood study uh, when I was wor uh, working and volunteering with a community organization in Mattapan and then heard about the study through uh, my work there and then ultimately ended up working at CLF as um, one of the uh, lead uh, managers on the study. 
Um, so the Healthy Neighborhood Study, it's a participatory action research project. So we're working in a consortium of uh, community, um, community organizations, residents, um, regional planners, at a uh, regional environmental organization, CLF, where I work, um, and then other academic institutions like uh, MIT's Department of Urban Studies. Um, and we do some collaboration with Harvard School of Public Health. And I'll also chime in and say at least one of uh, my colleagues, Gail Rodriguez, is also here today. Um, she jumped in, um, and there might be others too, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, the goals of the study are like first and foremost to understand the relationship between development um, and neighborhood change um, and population health and well being as in communities that are experiencing rapid development. Um, so, some might call it gentrification or transit oriented development. And we're really looking to build power with residents and organizations to help um, combat some of these cha changes build resilience and create healthy communities for um, the people that are living there now. Uh, so some of our big questions are uh, what changes in experiences, opportunities, health and quality of life are residents experiencing as the neighborhood is changing? Um, and, and also when it comes to transit oriented development, um, what's built, how, it, how is it being built? Who is it being built to benefit? And what roles do like residential mobility, so moving and displacement, chain, um, play in changes in those in population health? Um, and so we're looking at this in each of the communities, and also on a regional level, because we're we're uh, there are nine community organizations that are part of this study, um, all of them across Massachusetts, all communities that are experiencing um, rapid changes. Um, so. I work at the Conservation Law Foundation, which is, as I've said before, and I think you guys um, heard from Heather uh, Govern maybe last week, um, it's, a, it's an environmental organization. So why, why are we talking about housing at this environmental organization? Um, CLF's mission is that uh, we protect New England's environment for the benefit of all people. We use law, science, and the market to create solutions that preserve our natural resources build healthy communities and sustain a vibrant economy. So why are we talking about housing? Um, because we're looking at transit oriented development. Um, we're looking at changes that are happening in a community that are often connected to um, like envir the, en the environment itself and um, like, like having an impact on climate change. So things like green increasing green space, getting more people to take the train um, those are some of the efforts uh, that are part of transit-oriented development. But often um, what we see is that the community changes, um, a new, new parks are going in, uh, the transit line gets improved, and that leads to displacement. Um, so a lot of our community partners see these changes and they say, who are these changes happening for? Uh, we want to make sure that these changes are, are benefiting um, yes, the environment, yes, the community, but also first and foremost, the people who are in the community um, now, um, not necessarily people who are coming in. Of course, um, change is good, um, like having new people come in is good, but not um, displacing other people. Um, and so um, we're also in a climate crisis, as we all know, um, and that relates to housing. There's, there's an intersection there when you think about um, as the climate crisis is unfolding, we're seeing more flooding, we're seeing hotter hots, um, and we're and in our in our communities, that means that um, people may need you know to get their base. They may, may need to deal with basement flooding. Um, they mean they they may, may need to crank up the air conditioning when it's too hot. Um, and those have those are housing related issues. Um, and things that might actually push people out of a community if the rent is already going up and also their air conditioning bill is going up, um, that might make it not affordable to live there anymore. Um, and then there's climate gentrification. You know, people will be moving about as, as, as we're seeing the climate crisis unfold. And we wanna make sure that the communities, um, communities are able to stay resilient. Um, and we also know that place matters. So uh, like a lot of, we could, we, we're doing a study about neighborhood change 
and the communities that we're looking in are also the communities that are overburdened in lots of different ways um, by environmental just injustices. Um, by they, they're often communities with poorer health. Um, they often have, you know, the bus lot, and they're just in general over overly stretched. I'm sure you guys talk about this, and that's a lot of that's by design. Um, and so that's why we're talking about housing at uh, Conservation Law Foundation. And so dig, just to dig in a little bit about participatory action research, um, it's, it's an approach to research. It's not necessarily a method. You can do a participatory action research project and measure air quality. You can do a participatory action research project and um, do surveys. You can do a participatory action research project and just look at behind the scenes data. So it's not a specific method, but it's an approach to doing the work. Um, that's really focused on action, um, collecting data that's most essential for um, a community's actions and advocacy. So we're really trying to understand a complex social problem by trying to solve it. And when we try and solve it, we see, okay, like what new questions have unfolded in the, in the process of trying to solve this? And of course, it, it centers those who are most impacted by the issue. At CLF, we could have done a big uh, research project about displacement um, without the community, um, or um, but that would have looked like a very different study because we don't have the experience of living in a community that's experiencing displacement. And so we're really centering the questions um, that are asked by those who are most impacted by the issue. And we're, build, we're bridging uh, mainstream knowledge about um, about gentrification and displacement, things you might read when you pick up a newspaper or uh, an academic journal um, with the experience and the cultural knowledge. Um, we often talk at share this knowledge factory uh, with um, our community partners and when we're talking about our work, uh, just as an example of the way that research is commonly um, or information is commonly shared. So often uh, people in a community, community sources, have community sources of information. You might know, oh, you know, don't drive down uh, Main Street at 5 p.m. Because, uh, because there's traffic or something like that. Um, and you share that information with the community audience. There's, there, there, there's lots of conversation between, between the two. And then you have in institutional sources. So that would be like, like Northeastern, like an institution, um, like an academic institution or something like that, who are, they're often talking um, to institutional audiences. Um, but often those two sides are in parallel to each other, but they're not crossing. Um, and so we're thinking about what does it look like when these two paths cross? How do we bring community um, sources of information to institutional audiences? And we call that uh, the right to be heard. So when we're doing our research, we're often thinking about what does the community know that the institutional audiences need to hear? Um, and then on the other side, we're also thinking about what, what is being talked about in the institutions that the community Need, has the right to know. And so we have a process um, for doing our research. It's, it's very similar to any other research process, um, but when we are infusing our participatory action research values, it changes a little bit. So we start with community partnerships. We recruit some what we call resident researchers, so people who are living in the community or who have maybe been displaced from the community, but they have a, a connection to the community. Um, and together we're explore, exploring the relationship between place and health. We're figuring out what big questions do we have? What are our advocacy goals? Um, what do we need to know here? Uh, and then we figure out how do we, how do we need to find out that information? So we might, um, on our study, we have surveys and interviews. So we design them, we test them. Um, all the resident researchers, everyone does ethics training before they go out and actually survey. Then we also look at some secondary data and we do some analysis together and then we jump into action. So I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time um, doing like a deep dive, mostly with pictures because pictures are fun and they tell the story much better than I can. Um, so we start with recruiting 
partners and resident researchers. We have about 50 resident researchers um, who we are, who are in, in our consortium. So we went to specific community. Um, we were looking in specific communities when the study started and we um, recruited uh, particular organizations to, to work with us. And then those organizations recruited community champions, often community champions, but really anyone can be a resident researcher. The only qualification is that you have some connection to the, to the community. So you don't have to have any specific skills or anything like that. Um, resident researchers talk about all different kinds of skills that make them really great or feel comfortable um, going out and surveying. Um, and so really it can, anyone can be a resident researcher. You just have to come with some, some understanding of what's going on in your community or willingness to even um, like stop and think about what's going on. Uh, so we recruited our resident researchers. Then together we have to figure out um, what are we, what are our big questions? What are our big research questions? Um, what, what do we, what information do we need to know in order to advance advance advocacy. And so for us, that in, in involved the survey, like I said before. And so if this, this middle picture here is actually one of the resident researchers. We like blew up the survey on these really big pieces of paper um, as it was sort of being drafted and had people respond um, in, a, in a meeting. So that was just a way that we um, got, got everyone's input. Um, yeah. And so we figured out what our questions are. We went out and collected data. Um, our resident researchers are the ones doing most of the data collection and they do it based on a sampling plan. That's what these folks on the left are looking at. Um, so they figure out, um, okay, when we're thinking about these big questions that we have, who are the people that we feel or they feel um, voices are often missing from the conversation? Whose voices do they wanna lift up? Um, so they might say, okay, we, we really want to make sure that we capture the voice of um, low-income families. So they might say, okay, we want to we want to make sure we include low-income families. That means we might might want to recruit at like Head Start. Um, so then a site coordinator like Gail might call up Head Start and say, like, hey, can we search, can we set up a table to survey there? Um, otherwise, the surveying is a random sample of people. Um, so people aren't just like calling their friends and neighbors and saying, hey, take the survey. It really is based on this intentional sampling um, that, that the resident researchers and community partners come up with. Um, a lot of the resident researchers speak multiple languages, which is also really helpful. Um, and they're from a variety, a, like a, a diverse background that kind of matches the communities, which just makes sense um, and also helps with surveying because it's not like, um, a CLF staff member who lives out in Arlington coming into a community that they're not a part of to survey. It's really your, your neighbors, people who are from the community, people who look like you, who are saying like, hey, this matters for my community. Um, I've got some questions for you. Would you be up for, for talking for half an hour? Um, and they do the survey. The person gets uh, $20 for doing the survey. So there are some, some of the resident researchers out surveying in a variety of places. Uh, then we do all the surveying um, at CLF and MIT. We have the fun part of entering all the data. And then, uh, then we get together and we analyze it together. And that looks like a lot of like hypothesis generation together. We're not expecting people to sit in front of their computers and uh, like open up SAS or R or anything like that. But the resident researchers and our community partners are really saying like, what are the real hypotheses? How do we, like what facts are we generating here? Um, and then we, they might come up with those and we say, okay, um, on the backside, like, okay, so we need to run like a regression analysis and we go and do that. We bring that back and people might say, like when we were looking at um, mobility data recently, we were looking at the relationship between um, being stuck in health and we saw that there was a relationship there. And we were like, why might that be? And people said, well, let's look at our info, the data we've collected about um, social support. And when you add that in, what happened? So then we added that into the model and we saw that that was actually a mediator, which was pretty cool. Um, and so that's how we're analyzing data together. It doesn't require any specific skills um, other than just like thinking about your community and thinking about the big research questions. 
Um, we also have some um, qualitative data um, analysis that's, that's happening here where people were coding. Um, I see a question from Marga. No, oh, just, a, just a hand raise. Okay. You say Miss Margaret or do you say Marga? Oh, your name shows up as Marga. It looks like you have your hand up. Yes, I do. And it's not, it's Miss Margaret. Oh, sorry about that, Miss Margaret. All What's right. your question? I, I'm, first of all, I, I, I'm not putting this on you. Who is responsible for the time check in this process? Joan, somebody speak to it. Oh, Joan, you're muted. It's uh, 5 o'clock uh, Eastern time, and that's 2 o'clock in California. But I'm talking about the overall individual pre presentation. What was the time start and stop? We're starting at five and uh, you're the next speaker. Okay. Thank you. I, 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 okay. What? Okay. I, excuse me, but as a lifelong engager on, participa on participation in social justice, and I'm 74 years old. I would like for um, the speaker for us to have a conversation on some of the things that were asked and anybody else uh, at, with, with, that she put forward because there was a, a there is a pattern of growth that needs to be fulfilled if you're moving forward with this type of a focus. And I, I don't think she would get that type of mentorship within the university unless somebody has have uh, taken those steps. So um, I, um, I'm ready for my, my presentation. And thank you very much. Okay, um, as, it, as um, soon as, Ms. Gibson is done. Um, we'll we'll move right to yours. Because we we started with her because it's more um, overall framing, and then we're going to your specific case study. Go ahead. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so we do the collaborative data analysis. And, and just time check, I think I have about uh, five or six more slides, not too much more, um, maybe even fewer than that. Uh, and, then, um, and then we do action. So obviously it's participatory action research. So what well, we're going for the actions. And so um, some pictures here, like we have, so we have nine communities with nine different uh, advocacy goals and so everyone's kind of doing something a little bit different when it comes to action, which is really exciting, at least for me, because I get to be a part of all of the action projects. Um, and I see my role as sort of facilitating the process. I don't decide who does what or when or anything like that, but it's like I, I, my goal is to make sure that people have what they need and especially on the data side that they have the information and they've been able to dig into it in a way that um, helps them actually um, go ahead and do an action project. So we have a couple here um, in New Bedford and that's Gail Rodriguez is, was a big part of this effort um, to build a mural. So they looked at our data around uh, gentrification and feeling ownership over changes that are happening in the community. Um, and they noticed that there were lower, um, lower rates of feeling ownership over what was happening and lower civic engagement among the Cape Verdean community. And Dina Abreu um, is a part of the Cape Verdean Association in New Bedford. Um, so they actually commissioned this beautiful mural um, on the side of the, it's the, called the Bisca Club. Um, it's a Cape Verdean um, social club um, here. That's sort of like, it's got this beautiful, uh, like a woman sitting next to a kid and the kid is holding a boat which is sort of a representative of the whaling culture in New Bedford among the Cape Verdean community. And then 
the mom has a little vote pin. So it's sort of like a subtle message um, there to vote. And you can see some of like the big, um, the big, uh, the big uh, housing buildings in the background there that are that's New Bedford there. Uh, and then in Everett, they did something a little bit different, uh, educating people about uh, what they learned from the study um, it, at a big community event. And then we also do some regional action. Uh, this past summer, actually, we were looking at some of our data about um, heat and flooding um, and cooling and seeing that within our healthy neighborhood study communities, there was, they, the, there are hotter hots, essentially. Uh, and so we talked about that a little bit and talked about what to do about that. And people decided that they, everyone wanted to do a pop-up park and thinking about, thinking about cooling um, and thinking about educating the community, one, about COVID, because the, a lot of the, our communities also have higher COVID rates. Um, so education about COVID, um, education about heat, and also they all had sort of a cooling feature. And then also people wanted to get input on like if this were a, to become a permanent um, a permanent park, what would you want to see here? So there were different ways to get um, design ideas, which is pretty cool. And some of them actually will be some of these temporary pop up parks will become permanent parks, which is pretty cool. Um, got some key takeaways. I just thought I'd end with this for doing participatory action research. Um, the first, particularly from my perspective as someone who's coming from outside um, most of these communities, even though I grew up in Mattapan and have been, I've lived in Boston for many years now, um, I still, I when I'm at CLF, my role, I'm not, you know, at a community organization. And that's something that I have to be mindful of. Um, so, you know, I think about relationships as being key to this process, um, like taking the time to actually build relationships with the resident researchers, with the community partner organizations, understanding them and where they're coming from, um, understanding how they communicate, all of that stuff, um, questioning my own knowledge is something that I do a lot and where it comes from um, is something that's really important. Like, is my knowledge the same as, my knowledge base the same as Gail's knowledge base? We, we're, we're coming from different places essentially. And so we need to, I need to be mindful of that. Um, and then using strategies to, to shift power. Um, so funding is a big one. Um, a lot of our smaller community organizations don't um, they're always scrambling to find, find more funding. So how are we making sure within this process that we're giving them um, an appropriate amount of, of, of money to participate in this project with us? Um, and how are we also sharing other resources that we have at CLF? And also how are we lifting up, making sure to lift up their voices in this process? Um, and same with all of the resident researchers. So often instead of uh, you know, having one person stand up on a whiteboard and like write down what people say. We have people write down themselves, um, it, word for word, in their own words, what they what they what they think, um, or they can you know share it in a video or something like that. We try to be like interactive um, and think think about different ways that people learn and different ways that people communicate, so that we're making sure that um, their voices are included in whatever way makes sense for them. And then the last one I always think about um, on all ends is, is one of our ground rules, uh, listen to understand and share to be understood. Um, so when I'm talking, when we're doing collaborative data analysis, are we sharing so that people understand what we're trying to, what, what the message we're communicating instead of being focused on you know jargon or what a p-value is and stuff like that. Um, and then I've got some resources which I can send out the slides to you guys Great, thank you. Um, I think we can just take maybe one question now and then we'll move on to Ms. Margaret Gordon. Um, does anyone, and then we'll all go into a conversation Ooh. afterwards. Is there a question now? I can share my slides for sure. I can send them to John. Great. 
Okay, so now we will move on to Ms. Margaret Gordon um, and the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. And I will bring up your slides if you want to um, reveal Thank yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. Just a second. Okay, I will put you in pre presenter um, mode and, and you may, there we are. That, is that the first one slide, that's number one? Yes. Okay, all right, the, the history of West Oakland, we go back to the development of what California is, has been developed over the years. You're one of the first uh, cities that were developed and with those cities that developed over the years, going back to the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, it's always about heavy industrial development. And that as of today, we still do not have, we see on this um, slide, we still do not have a really, um, we, don't, we don't have a, a real grocery store. And, and at the bottom, you see that we have still chronic unemployment even before it was the pandemic. And 1989, we had the freeway to divide us. So we have had multiple levels of circumstances that have divided us, divided us from being part of the bigger community. Next slide. West Oakland children, we know from, our, from doing our community participatory research, and you're gonna hear more about this, that our children and a 94607 zip code are more and likely going to emergency hospital for asthma than someone lives on the other side of the mountain and a, and a community, African community called Lafayette. Next slide. Our methodology of environmental justice is about reduce, reuse, revive, and reveal, recycle. And in the middle, you see rebuilding relationships. If you don't have the capacity to build relationships, that's very problematic for anyone. I don't care who you are. If you don't have the dots uh, to fulfill those gaps of understanding what trust and relationships mean, mean as you move forward in these communities who are disproportionately impacted on multiple levels for climate justice and environmental justice with many disparities. How do you, how, what is the, what is the tools and the building blocks to build relationships and trust? Next slide. What do we do? We participate in anything around air for West Oakland, climate uh, uh, the climate adaptation plan that has, was proposed for West Oakland, and the community influence on every every revitalization. So every project that mostly coming into West Oakland, we have some kind of communication about it. We have a group of residents. They want to speak to about how this project improves the community or does not improve the community. Next slide. Here's our programs, air quality. We deal with indoor, outdoor air quality and diesel, and more recently, black carbon. Then our uh, climate change adaptation is removing, with which we are being in for 20 years trying to move the recyclers out of the neighborhood. We have those recyclers that has been in it, have a multiple level of products that they recycle that come into uh, that have established a business in West Oakland. And that we see that any, uh, 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 how we approach any developer that comes into the community, how does it re revitalize and support the community? And the last thing, those projects, I mean, those projects that come into 
the community? How do we make the planning process change its thinking around energy security and project? Understand protection of all those things around environmental, around the envir environmental uh, climate change as, uh, in regard to air, water, and soil. Next slide. So here are our tools, research, education, community measurement, base building. We came as an organization that was supported in the beginning from, from the Pacific Institute, which is a water, basically a water institute, supported us on, and given us the capacity and education. How do we build a community of knowledgeable people on based on first thing on having a community based participatory research. So this goes back to almost 1994. Then when we start establishing working from a place a community paid based research and all those things that supported a community to be able to adapt itself to understanding the move forward um, with leadership and advocacy. Next slide. And I collect the model and we share, we want, we also not uh, that share the process, we want to share the power. And these are the agencies, jurisdictions, community organizations, we all have a great deal of power and residents that we want will be sitting at the table. And, the, and that table means that they have the uh, they they will have the ability to express how they want to move forward in solution development on this project. Next slide. Yes, Brian Brian Beverage is who are over here to the left. He's the other co-director, and I am. I didn't, I didn't say this earlier. I am the, one of the founders and the co-director of West Oakland Environmental Indicators. And we sit on various boards and commissions, planning initiatives up and down the state of California and a few across the nation. But our, our, our base understanding of having people have the ability of ownership and being a stakeholder is that you got to be able to own the process and empower yourself to be able to speak about your apprehensions or your uh, forward thinking on, on whatever's being discussed at that time. And if you see also, we have regulatory groups that we work with also. Next slide. Decision-making. We have prioritized, we have provided a community and environmental center perspective. And like I said, have ownership and are working towards for all whoever sit at, our, sit at our table. Not just being exclusive, cultural, and bringing the community concerns to the front front. We also would like to keep discussing our issues from a place of being more proactive, more engageability, having lots of engageability, and understanding how we pursue those steps that have historically keeping communities like West Oakland not being able to have the power to make change, the power to make change and work from a model of being able to, people understand how to build consensus. Because if you give people the ability to vote, you're gonna be outnumbered, whereas you outnumbered to the place where you don't even get to have the conversation. So having this uh, consensus building, you continue to have the dialogue and the conversation. Next slide. The boardroom to the classroom, like I said, we like I said, we own our own experience. We teach those and reach those and flip the interests of our perspective. Next slide. 
We also have our own ability to have our own equipment. In 2009, we did a project with uh, Intel, who had a prototype project at the University of Ber uh, UC Berkeley that we worked on and uh, we worked with them to bring on the ground devices to train community to understand what was it like to have the laboratory or our lab to, to identify what is the pollution inside your community. We have never, I, I don't know nobody else as developing uh, a uh, understanding of citizen science that we were able to have We are able to have a ability to bring our existing, I want to say, on the ground research around air quality with these, with this, with this dust tracker. Okay, next slide. We also have our mapping out all the projects and programs within our community for influence revitalization. I, uh, whatever it is, we, we tried to have that conversation. We're going to make place to have a conversation with whoever is doing what and what's so forth. Next slide. This is uh, the, uh, a map uh, that's uh, identifying where our flood zone is and we around sea level rise. And if you see the largest areas, the largest areas to your left, Far to your left, this area right here is more poor people. This right here is more homeowners. This right here is the more the industrial area. This is the Bay Bridge, and this is all this right in here is also part of the port. So we know, we, we also know these folks got plenty of insurance to, care, to take care of any of their individual facilities. Here, maybe they do. Here, I know they don't. All right. And this also, this right here is Alameda. This is also uh, the city of itself, the city, part of the city, uh, uh, parts of the city, Oakland. And this right here is broken into to two areas between the city of Oakland and Emeryville. Next slide. Our citizen science go back to what I was talking about with Intel. Next slide. And how we, like I said, how we have exercised the bill, the power of community-based research started way back and our efforts that we work with Pacific Institute and the UC Berkeley Institute of Urban and Regional Development. Next slide. Here are some of our, our, our community participatory research documents that we have put forth and our partnership with the Pacific Institute. So these are our, our, our documents that we have produced in the last 15, almost 20 years of doing our work. Next slide. And we see that, you know, doing those EI, West Oakland Environmental, having those community benefits, community benefits research project has supported us doing the work that we did with Intel out of air quality monitoring. And our, the person who's doing the training on the on hands training for our project is from the community. Next slide. We also did a project with uh, Lawrence Hall of Science the, uh, engagement around putting a hundred sensors between West Oakland and the Port of Oakland to look at Black Harbor. Next slide. Here's one of the, the devices. This is one of the devices that we put through for the 100 by 100 project through West Oakland. And one of the things that we did do for those who community members who said that they will put a, one of the devices on their property, we did give them a stipend. Thank you.
Next slide. This is Brian. So this is another project that we did where we ran uh, that, well, the Google car, a Google car with a sensor on it from uh, Akamont who did three, th uh, three million measurements over 1400 miles. And with uh, those dates that's indicated here, for hyperlocal information that we have never had on the ground is doing a project that uh, that deals with block by block, by, uh, block by block. People understand that regional air models is always five stories high and it's not on the ground where community is to really accurately to tell us what is happening to our air quality? All right, block by block. Next, next slide. Here's me, 2007, the, the state of California has an initiative that supports having what you call a community-centric air monitoring project and a community project that support community to have their own action plan around the reduction of air, water, and soil issues. Next slide. Here are some of the things we have engaged with the community around getting to the place of having an action plan. Action plan. Out, coming out the, uh, at the beginning of the whole legislation of the action plan, or uh, AB 6.7, West Oakland Environmental Indicators went directly to develop the process for action over just doing the model. Next slide. Here's another project that we did within the school, a local school called On Our Air, where we were in, uh, in, uh, involved with the school of Prescott and students from local high school and, and uh, students from Prescott and their parents about understanding what was the air quality issues of West Oakland. Next slide. All right, we have the place where, hey, ask me any questions. Thank you. You're most welcome. Um, okay, so we will, let me stop this share. Um, if there's maybe w one question, I think then we'll continue with West Oakland and, and take all questions. But if anyone has a question right now, we'll, we can go with that. Y'all don't be scared. Halloween is two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Let's. What was one of your favorite projects that you've worked on? One of my favorite projects that I have worked on is that my favorite projects once I became a commissioner for the Port of Oakland. I was nominated and accepted. It took it, it, it took a while because the Port of Oakland staff and the local officials did not know who I was. But that was that to me was a most significant clarification on what this means to be, empowered, be involved in environmental justice. Because I got to see things uh, in place that I did not know was happening outside of West Oakland. And that clearly gave me a much more rich enhancement that was not about West Oakland. It was, it was a multiple scale issue worldwide. And also, gave me the insight on what was the other technologies, devices that were being used in Europe that had not been even explored, have, have not even been explored in the United States. So it was like, that was my more clarifying moment if I was gonna do this, that I not only, I had to 
absorb a lot of different things to be able to interject, project, introduce, educate, orientate, advocate. I had a multiple level of, of, of a purpose. Great. So part of that was your serving on a, a government commission. So I think we'll, we'll turn it over now to Azabuke Akabe, who is your partner in, in terms of government partnering with the community organizations. Thank you. Hey, don't go away. We'll be back with questions. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Azabuke Akaba, and I'm the community engagement part of senior public public information officer for the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And in different lives, I was um, a researcher um, uh, leading a program on uh, transportation, public health, and land use for, for the Public Health Institute, which is a research institute based in Oakland. And I've also served as a technical person for uh, Miss Margaret's organization, but I've also advised many community groups around industrial uh, pollution and public health policy recommendations uh, in the state of California. So the thing that I was going to talk about is to complement Ms. Margaret's presentation is that they've taken the, the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project has taken the citizen science piece to a level where they're actually not just collecting data, but they've politicized the data to work with the government agencies and universities to make policy recommendations at the state level, at the regional level, and at the local level, like the city of Oakland, the port of Oakland. Um, so, um, in, in understanding that, you know, they started off as a community group, but now they are influencers. You know, they actually influence policy. A lot of uh, nonprofits consult with Ms. Margaret and Brian uh, around how to best do the collaborative model which they promote, um, uh, just to have ways in which the universities, the government agencies, the private companies can collaborate. Ms. Margaret uh, successfully led a collaboration with uh, Google Acclima, so they were able to collect data uh, from West Oakland and uh, work with the Air District to verify that data. And now they're using it as guidance on where to place monitors um, and look at um, the heavy impact of particulates. Um, that's an important piece. So at, at this point, I'm just trying to emphasize the credibility and the influence uh, position that West Oakland Environmental Indicators has. As a government agency, working with a government agency, we were tasked in 2017 to uh, develop a collaborative model um, for looking at local, em local emissions from the um, pollution from stationary sources, mobile sources. It was almost like a cumulative impact assessment. And that's actually, I don't think it's ever been done before, not in collaboration with a government agency. Um, and I also think that um, the collaboration between West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project and the um, Bay Area Air Quality Management District is quite unique uh, in the sense that that collaboration even though it's not smooth, it's not a uh, glid, it's a, it's a very tough relationship. And at times it's very funny. We have a lot of good times, but we were meeting on the 8617 um, 
community uh, admissions um, policy, we met for a year and a half. And, and in that process, we brought, we invited like 40 different stakeholders, uh, faith communities, faith churches, uh, school board members, uh, companies that are based in West Oakland. We brought in the Port of Oakland as a Port Authority, and we brought in the city and also different government agencies like the Department of Public Health the um, Caltrans in California, they're in charge of infrastructure for freeways. And um, so we brought all these agencies together and the companies and the community residents all at the same table. And we called it the steering committee. So we spent an entire year and a half developing a plan with strategies. At the end, we developed a report called Only in Our Air. And it was basically guidance for um, the community and the government agencies to figure out how they can reduce emissions and how they can reduce exposure. Those are the two main things that the 86.7 um, legislation was looking at. And um, I think the idea is that you know we brought all those people at the table and it's the first time a lot of the different government agencies were working with uh west oakland and even uh, even playing field so everybody understood that it's a new process very experimental but there was ambitious uh goals in order to produce policy recommendations in one year. In fact, it actually took 18 months um, because we had to build up those relationships. And then in the second phase of the AB 617 planning is the implementation. So the plan itself took 18 months and now it's gonna take five years to look at how the plan was implemented. All of, they had over a hundred strategies that were recommended. Some of the strategies were very basic, like street cleaning. Some of the strategies included and complemented existing policies like the Oakland Truck Management Plan. And also the Port of Oakland had a 2020 plan, which looked at how they were gonna reduce emissions from the operations at the port. The, the, we call that equipment, the uh, off-road equipment and the diesel equipment, including the trucks uh, servicing the port and uh, and operations of the ship. So, and they're incorporating different strategies like electrification of the tugboat, electrification of the uh, carrier freight carriers, the, the tractor trailers, and then and and looking at infrastructure like charging stations and things like that. So Chris, Margaret and Brian uh, were key in participating in the process because I think they um, as a see, we can generate collaborative leadership at the top of the at the top at the inception instead of generally agent government agencies and I've worked at quite a few government agencies develop plans and then they contact the community as an afterthought. So in this case, um, Miss Margaret and Brian were brought in at the very beginning of the process. <clears throat> so that's the overview and I definitely hope how to build relationships or how to translate uh, participatory research into actual policy guidance. Uh, that's something that's important. Um, it's, it's not easily done because of the issues around class and jargon and things like that. So we had a lot of training throughout the first year to prepare the community members to understand the technical language and planning, like tracking, metrics, uh, goal setting. And then we also um, 
created um, exercises where the community new members could lead that process. So that's that's the overview, and we're going to be doing the same model throughout uh, the Bay Area. There's at least ten communities like uh, Richmond, um, Vallejo, East. Oakland and Eastern San Francisco. So those are all communities where we're taking what was learned in the West Oakland uh, community emissions program to the next level. And I think it would propagate to the other states, I mean, to other uh, regions of the state like San Diego, Imperial Valley, because they all have an opportunity to use the, eight, to use the 8617 um, process. So I'll close right there. Great. Very, a very good um, depiction of, I think, the hesitancy that government agencies might have and uh, with working with um, community organizations on science. Is there uh, one question before we move on and then um, we we'll, can open it up to questions for everyone? Goodness, we're quiet tonight. All right, so everyone stay on. I think we'll um, have more questions after after everyone's done. I certainly have a lot more questions, but let's hear about the interesting projects that David Sittenfeld is running from the Museum of Science. Thanks, uh, Professor Fitzgerald. Um, and let me just say, uh, it's really an honor to be on this panel uh, with the other presenters. There are some environmental health heroes, uh, as long as as well as a couple of other names I see in the participants tab. Um, so thanks for inviting me to speak and, and having me be part of this. Um, as you heard uh, in the introduction, I'm a doctoral researcher in my advisor, Professor Helmus lab at Northeastern. Um, and uh, I also manage the forums and national collaborations department at the Museum of Science. And just to say that uh, for years, we've had our summer air quality interns read about the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project to help inform what their project should look like. And assuming I get through my slides fast enough, I'll make a really nice connection to air quality at the end with a new project that we're part of. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a process that we're calling science to civics. Uh, that both Northeastern and the Museum of Science are involved in uh, for facilitating community science campaigns. And I'm going to focus in particular on our heat mapping work here in Boston. And I think it will build nicely on what you've heard uh, already. At least one of my colleagues, uh, Sarah Benson, is on this call. And I think she might be putting some links in the chat. Uh, you can see a picture of her. She's one of the people with the uh, monitor on the vehicle on the right-hand side. And uh, I think Professor Helm was on too. Uh, so they might chime in as well. Um, so I want to provide a little bit of local context for this conversation, although I think Rianne did a wonderful job doing that. Um, our work is done under the auspices of connecting informal science education uh, to policy and building community resilience around locally relevant uh, issues. And in the upper left hand corner, we see a headline from the Boston Globe uh, about an issue that's really been uh, very sort of in the news uh, the last few months. Uh, the trees along Melnia Cass Boulevard right near the Northeastern campus. Um, and in the lower left hand corner is a picture of Morrissey Boulevard, uh, which spans uh, Dorchester and South Boston and floods pretty much every time we have a king tide, which we're in right now. Um, and both of these issues are happening in neighborhoods that are home to high proportions of people of color and also families with young children, which have both been identified as groups that are of particular vulnerability in the Climate uh, Ready Boston report. So our work seeks to include local and digital knowledge and multiple ways of knowing in the co-production of scientific knowledge and policy to address these kinds of questions. And it's built on this idea that because people are downstream of effects like environmental health questions or climate resilience, um, we really want people to be engaged in the design of what equitable policies and solutions should look like. And I'm not going to go too much into the details, but I, I want to acknowledge that this work is part of a national project we're leading uh, that's led by the funded by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And so 28 science museums around the world are working with community, civic, and other kinds of partners to collaboratively sort of set the agenda and then do decision making and policy forming for community science campaigns around these four climate hazards of sea level rise, heat, extreme precipitation, and drought. Uh, uh, you can see some of the partners in the, the thing on the bottom. I'll give some examples. Uh, and, and just quickly, here are the elements that um, communities include 
in these kinds of science specific community science campaigns. I'm gonna focus primarily on the data collection and the analysis here, but we really are leaning into what you've heard about from the prior speakers uh, with an explicit policy forming step and trying to work with government and civic partners to try to create things that are actionable um, and a solution envisioning component and connect it to the policy cycle, which we know is ongoing. So we try to find ways for people to jump in and be involved in community science wherever they hear about it. It's never too late for them to get involved. Uh, so I'm going to focus primarily on a campaign that got some uh, attention last summer. It was called Wicked Hot Boston, and it's a heat mapping campaign. But I do want to mention that we're doing it with each of the four hazards I described earlier, and I'll mention sea level rise if I get to it. Um, and just a tiny bit of context for this. Heat is the silent storm. It kills more Americans each year than floods, earthquakes, tornadoes. Um, but we don't hear that much about it. And we're particularly concerned about the impacts on people of color and low income populations, as well as, you know, cumulative harms with things like asthma um, in urban areas and the projected increase in the number of very hot days uh, here in Boston, as our summers may become more like places like Washington DC, where I'm from, or even Birmingham, Alabama, by the end of this century, if the climate projections um, that are on the higher side uh, bear out which is what you see from the Climate Ready Boston report here. And we know that not everywhere in a community experiences these extreme events the same way. There are disproportionate impacts uh, based on urban heat island effects that are connected to land use and other kinds of factors. So on the right hand side, you can see a tool that was being used uh, from resilience planners for a long time. It was created by the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, uh, which is a quasi state uh, regional planning authority here in Massachusetts. And it sort of confirms that there's an urban heat island effect, but it didn't have very high resolution. And we heard um, Ms. Margaret talk about the sort of block by block very important need for hyper localized data. And so oh. this uh -oh. This tells us that uh, Boston is much hotter than the surrounding suburbs, but really we want this neighborhood level data. And so we had municipal partners in Cambridge, Boston and Brookline that wanted a clearer view of that, which areas were the hottest and how can that inform their plans. Also, um, my colleague Sarah always likes to remind people that this is first of all showing land surface temperature. So it's showing up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit and so you can cook an egg on the ground, but that doesn't actually tell you anything about what people are experiencing um, in terms of air. And also we wanted to get nighttime temperatures because we know that the nighttime is really when people tend to get, to get uh, you know, sick. So to do this, we implemented a community science project doing an urban heat mapping campaign using a method that was developed by uh, Fivek Shandis from Portland State University and uh, Jeremy Hoffman from the Science Museum of Virginia. And what happens is people drive around with a temperature sensor at three times on a very hot day during a heat wave um, that collects data, um, geospatial data about humidity, temperature, and other kinds of uh, covariates. And so we worked really closely with city planners in Brookline, Boston, and Cambridge to divide the three cities into 10 mapping routes. Uh, that was, Sarah did a lot of work on that. And com uh, community science teams were made up of a driver and a nav navigator who drove together during hour long mapping periods uh, at six o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon, and seven o'clock in the evening to characterize the urban heat islands in each places at very high resolution. And this happened uh, over four days uh, with over 50 community scientists participating. So really quickly on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the data from those 10 transects that were driven by the community scientists at three o'clock, which is the hottest uh, time that we recorded unsurprisingly. Um, and so this is an example of what you get from each of the sensors. And then these transects that you see on the left were uh, used, uh, informed a machine learning algorithm that incorporates satellite uh, imagery and land use land cover data. And so what you get is this resulting map on the right hand side that shows you very, very high resolution heat distribution for the entire city and the surrounding areas. And um, what you can see here is the modeled air temperature for the entire region at 3 p.m. We also took real field humidity uh, or modeled real field humidity. And the maximum temperature that was measured during this time was 102 degrees Fahrenheit in Dorchester near the Ashmont T station and in the South End with a heat index of 108 degrees Fahrenheit. And this was uh, quite warmer than the uh, temperature that was reported at that depth time at Logan Airport, which is the official recording location, which was 92 degrees. We saw a difference um, of 15 degrees Fahrenheit between the warmest and the coolest areas at this time. So 
that means that people are 15 degrees hotter um, in terms of what they're feeling in some parts of the community compared to others. Um, and so this is this really sort of speaks to the disproportionate impacts. Um, this is a clo closest uh, close up of the hottest area that we recorded, which was Ashmont, although East Boston, Seaport, South Boston, there were a lot of areas that were quite hot. Um, and the hottest time uh, was here, this location in Ashmont, and you can see a 10 degree difference um, between what the news reports and what people are actually feeling in these areas. And this gives us a good sense of, you know, what people are experiencing. Uh, and this is actually a zoomable map. You can really get down to the neighborhood level and get the exact temperature of your neighborhood, as uh, Ms. Margaret was talking about. So city planners have been using this data, and I'll talk about it in a minute, uh, as it can help to inform our resilience planning. I do want to show just a little bit of the findings uh, up close and talk a, lot, a little bit about the characteristics that were associated with the hottest places we saw and what that means for neighborhoods. So here's that hot spot I just showed in Ashmont. And um, one thing that we saw in a lot of these locations was a lack of green space and unshaded areas. You can kind of tell from this picture that I pulled from Google Earth that this is not a shaded place, even though there's a little bit of green space across the street. Um, this is a lot of blacktop and asphalt in this hottest location. Um, here's South End, uh, and another major area was being far away from water and near major highways or roadways. We heard about the impacts of roadways uh, earlier and also the cumulative effects of air quality on that. So like Ashmont, this is also true for this area in the South End, which was one of our hottest locations, along with East Boston and other uh, locations that I've mentioned already. So. Um, to talk a little bit about how the data are being used, first, we presented the results of the data at a deliberative forum event in Boston called Wicked Hot Boston, in which community planners from each of those locations and community partner organizations presented and were part of conversations with uh, community scientists and interested people. So you can see uh, the lady in the head wrap is Nancy Smith from the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, and she is sitting at a table actually with several other environmental planners and regular people that were involved helping to hear and inform uh, how communities can uh, stay cooler and social equity uh, dimensions. The outcomes were also included in the recent update to the Climate Ready Boston's adaptation report. Uh, and in addition, uh, they've been referenced in a report that came out just last month from the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab and the city's Parks and Rec Department. We worked with them to share and interpret our data sets and they produced the figures that you see here, which found statistically significant spatial correlations between Boston's tree canopy and a spatial variable that they defined as greenness, um, basically showing that places that are less green were statistically significant to be hotter, which is unsurprising. Um, and, and so now I want to connect to what we heard previously and what we know about the social determinants of health and the disproportionate impacts of neighborhoods that are home to socially po uh, vulnerable populations, and uh, in particular areas that are home to high proportionate of uh, people of color or low income. And this is demonstrated by this side-by-side -side comparison I made, um, comparing our heat mapping data in the city of Boston with these maps from Dr. Atia Martin's uh, Social Vulnerability Index from the Climate Ready Boston report. And this connects to historic racism and the historic redlining of these areas, which I'm going to talk about now. Um, so our colleague Jeremy Hoffman from the Science Museum of Virginia and co-authors of Portland State led a national study last year that was published in the Journal of Climate that compared redlining data with heat in 108 cities, including Boston, based on Landsat surface temperature. And it got a lot of attention, including this interactive in the New York Times, if you haven't seen it, based on Richmond, it's really quite powerful and, and troubling. Uh, and this made us want to dive into the findings for our air temperature mapping here in Boston, since we had air temperature uh, to work with. So we followed the method that had been developed by our partners uh, at the Science Museum of Virginia and Portland State to look at the heat impacts of these discriminatory, discriminatory historic redlining practices. And the figures that you see here demonstrate a clear and compelling correlation between areas that were historically redlined through racist policies of the federal government's homeowners uh, loan corporation in the 1930s um, and basically confirm the Landsat data study that had been shown earlier. Unsurprisingly, but pretty convincingly, we saw statistically significant differences between areas that had been rated as good or desirable, um, which are classified as A or B on the top and experienced lower temperatures, compared with those that were identified as declining or hazardous on the bottom and experienced warmer temperatures. We found a mean difference of nearly two degrees Fahrenheit for air temperature, which is huge, and it really demonstrates the disproportionate impacts that people in these formerly uh, redlined neighborhoods are experiencing. I'm almost done, I promise. 
Um, so thinking about the land use dimensions of this, I looked at the percent impervious surface covering these areas, and we see a pretty striking correlation with the heat impacts we shared earlier. Here we see in the map and the tabular data um, that the zip codes that were graded as good are, of course, are correlated with much lower percentage of impervious surface. Um, and so I think there's a real opportunity to improve the land use in the locations that we see at the bottom of this map. Um, and similarly, tree cover. Trees provide a shading function. We know that this is very important. And so we've looked um, again at the areas that were rated as good. And you can see that some of the locations are experiencing up to 60% tree canopy with a mean of 45% for good rated locations. And others in the locations that were rated as hazardous are down near zero with an average percentage of 12%. And that's a huge difference and clearly an area that needs to be changed. So I would argue that tree canopy and land use equity need to be part of the plan going forward and their important co-benefits to air pollution, stormwater management, um, and people in the city of Boston are, are thinking about that. I do wanna acknowledge that these practices can promote gentrification as Rianne was talking about. And we know that these hot locations are in areas that are home to high proportions of people of color and low income. And there are important discussions about how to do this equitably. Um, just a note to make the connection to COVID-19 again. The areas that are C and D, which were so hot, contain most of Chelsea, Everett, and East Boston. And these neighborhoods are also close to Logan Airport and other industrial locations and have high exposures to ultrafine particulates and particulate matter that we heard about earlier. And um, we also know that these are the areas that are experiencing the high COVID rates because of higher proportion of uh, essential workers, in particular because of Latinx populations there or connect connected to Latinx populations. And so this is one of the hottest locations that we found in Chelsea. And we see that there's a clear connection with lack of tree uh, cover and near major highways. Uh, and so this indicates cumulative harms happening on top of each other uh, in terms of heat, COVID and air quality and, and an area for further investigation and change. Uh, happily, uh, people know this. And so um, we're part of a group that uh, recently got a grant uh, with the Mystic River Watershed Association, MAPC, Green Roots, and the 21 municipalities of the Mystic River uh, Collaborative to bring the mapping to these communities along the Mystic River, uh, including air quality assessment and help identify uh, opportunities for making change uh, through changes to land use. I'm gonna stop there um, and make sure that we have time for conversation. Um, and uh, if there's anything else that we can pop into the chat or whatever, that's fine. Thanks. Thank you, all of you, I think um, gives us a really comprehensive view of different ways that residents can be involved in, um, in collecting science data uh, about their neighborhoods and influencing policy. So I'm going to open it up to questions. I was hoping to start. Um, my name's China. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. You know, I have trouble with my sound sometimes. Um, so I would open this up to um, all of the speakers since it's going to uh, link some of the questions. Um, so my question is, with the heat map and with the Wicked Hot Boston, we have these maps and have this data that point that these urban areas are being un, um, unequally imp impacted by heat. Um, but what does that translate to in the sense of actually making change? Um, I'm just wondering what the next step is to get people the relief that they need when it comes to the unequal exposure to COVID or even just having not even having access to AC during the summer in Boston. So I'm, it's not a one question for one person in particular. I'm just curious on what your thoughts are. Thank you. I'll chime in quickly, but I hope others will too. I, a couple of things. One is that this kind of data collection can help identify places to look at in terms of which mitigation solutions are really making a difference, right? So I know the Trust for Public Land is really interested in looking if there's another round of heat mapping at places that may be depaved between the time that uh, you know the mapping is done and then when it's done again. So the West Oakland work is really inspiring because they've done it a number of times and have helped to sort of understand what strategies may be effective, cost effective, all of that. There's a lot of other answers that I think the other panelists are, are better equipped to, to give. I see um, Brian Beveridge that you've joined us too as uh, Ms. Margaret's uh, co-founder co, uh, and, and director. Um, so feel free to chime in on this, any questions this about heat mapping 
mm -hmm. and so forth as well. Well, I would offer that um, uh, heat mapping is as an example, air quality mapping at ground level is an example. Any data that we can gather about a, a subject area um, does a couple of things. Um, it's, it's often the case, I, I think it's almost universally the case, that a data set does not, does not lead directly to a policy outcome. Mm -hmm. So we're always eager to get to the change, but the, the uh, translation and insight element that, that goes with having data is really where the change is, to, is defined and determined. So the power of this work is not only to include people in gathering data, and so they better understand science and can think about things in the way scientists think about them. They can listen to researchers talk about data uh, better, but it's, it's also for them to internalize that data, that science, for the community members to internalize the, an understanding of it and then turn that around and speak it in their own words and talk about the issues talk, and then begin to to begin to talk about solutions. So the solutions for high heat days, you know, the, the short solution so that people don't die of heat stroke is how do we get people air conditioners? Or how do we set up cooling centers within communities where people can go if they have no other option, right? Uh, I, I grew up in the South. Uh, it was uh, the, the shopping malls were cooling centers. Yeah, they used to open early in the morning so that senior citizens could go and, you know, before business, they could go and sit in there, they could walk around the mall and get exercise. It was cool inside, right? Uh, that was before anyone thought about cooling centers. It just made sense. Um, it was also a marketing ploy for the shopping mall. Um, so we've got that, but then we have what are long-term solutions to heat island effect? And those are changes in infrastructure, which take a lot more time. But if communities don't ever understand what green infrastructure means, if communities don't understand the value of trees, um, if they don't protect the trees they have, instead of saying, well, I don't like the tree because it puts leaves on my sidewalk and I have to sweep them up, right? A lot of things happen like that. There, there are so many I won't call them misconceptions, but there are so many various conceptions about things and about change that we have to use data to bring our neighbors along and help them better understand what their options are for a healthier community. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that explanation. Thank you. Other questions? I have hit my hand up. Yes. Okay, I think being in a place where you just started off from a, a very, very, very beginning and do not have a lot of the research to give you guidance to do the organizing. I think you need to be very clear and clear, have lots of clarification where you're going and who is supporting uh, the ability to be in a place of leadership and power share. And that you got to have a balance between the, whoever is sitting at the table as leadership. And also who is, who is using the building blocks to build trust and relationship to move forward? Or is that part of the plan of action? And also, what is the economic development plan to support everybody having a, a slice, a slice of the pie? Uh, that all those things have to be worked out until uh, uh, such a place where everybody is focused on these multiple levels of where we're trying to go, and that if. That is not part of the uh, remedy or the solution. You're going to have a problem because you've got to be able to connect the dots, close the gaps, 
and look at this beyond just a sprint, but a marathon of engagement because we have had years and years and years of not being able to process as that this is a reality for democracy across the board for everybody. No one had, no one had an expectation that gentrification would be at the center of the things I just got to talk about. Air, water, and soil, who get to live where, where the resources are coming, how much is the land, how much is the land, how, who get to purchase the land, what is the land use? Those type of things were not being really, if they were, I, I, I missed that as part of the education going into the 21st century. And nobody has, I mean, you know, those are steps. And I'm, I'm also understanding not only the climate change, but the justice piece of it. What is the justice part to make sure everyone has the ability to have no harm done to them? No harm. Well, that's a, yeah. That's a good point. One of the projects we worked on in Oakland was a, uh, was a um, um, sort of an opportunity investment zone project. And we were working on equity principles for that project. And um, it was a um, it was a green zones kind of thing where money would go to fix up parks or could fix up other green zones in the city. But one of the things we had to consider was um, even though we have some really miserable looking parks in some of our poorer neighborhoods, one of the criteria we set was before you could go in and spend a bunch of money fixing a park, you had to do an analysis of how that improvement would impact rents and the cost of housing in the blocks around that park because the direct, there's a direct pathway from cleaning up an environment and planting more trees and greening a community to, gentrif to gentrifying that community um, and people getting priced out, right? So these are, you know, these are parts of the, uh, the nuance of bringing about change is really critical. Um, and you need to also understand that the agencies uh, you know, do talk about equity, but they have not fine-tuned it to a place where it's, it is across the board equitable for everyone based on race, color, economics, status, education, all those things. And there, there's no, there's no engage, there's no, uh, there's no process to, to really address address those things. When we look up, we will start looking at projects, programs, initiatives, policy. Yeah, for a lot of for a lot of people. Oh, sorry, Miss Margaret. For a lot of people. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Brian. I, that, I think they understand that. Hey, we've been we've been we've been at this for a while. <laughs> we've been at this while. For, we've been at this rodeo for a, a, a while about over talking to each other. That's true. Right. Uh, I, I love you too, Brian. Gonna, yes, yes, absolutely. Can we move on? Because um, we're running a little late here, but I'd love to get an, at least one more question in. Please. Um. Hi, I had a question for Miss Margaret. Um, when bringing the community on board, have you found that they're eager to be involved or they take a little more convincing? And if that's the case, what have you found are some effective methods to bring community members into the fold? It's all of it. What you just said it's all of it. I have to I have to deal with every every I have I have done with every point of your question and doing this work. I, I have I have residents, but I have understand, I'm going back to this, I'm going to about the place I understand. People need to get on board for the sprint or the marathon. Okay? Mm -hmm. the, and, and that's your choice. That's a personal choice. 
I came on board as part of a marathon. I have missed many things that apply to my children, my grandchildren. Only person who now gets my undivided attention is my great granddaughter. But I have missed many graduations, dinners, oh, birthday parties, Easter, Thanksgiving meals, Christmas meals, all those different things because of I, I want to pursue this passion that I had created for myself to be as this community lead, a leader. And I have to be very honest and open and accountable. It does hurt. But at the end of the day, you need to be able to explain to those you heard that, hey, it was never not just about me. It was that I, I, was, I was in the process of thinking about as a we, all a we. And I think the clarification, I think we don't have that, clar that clarification. We, we don't have the clarification of identifying from those who's supposed to be in the place of educating us of all those details. But at the same time, you have to be able to be on the journey to find those things that don't connect to you, but you need to connect to, to, to move your own personal agenda. I have my own personal agenda and there ain't nothing wrong with you having your own personal agenda. And I think, especially for women, there's nothing wrong with you having your own personal agenda because we don't get the same level of anything that God that give us the ability to be leaders. We have to fight every step, every, as my grandmother said, knee touch a bit, every little bit, we have to fight for it as women to be leaders. And I, 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 you know, I've been saturated in that since I think, I understand to uh, mop, mop, mop my own piss off the, off the floor, but when I peed on the floor and, and a diaper, and a cloth diaper, okay? I have six siblings, siblings. I have five of them. Four of us living now. I have 16 grandchildren. I have one great granddaughter. And this is a lot of right here who lives with me. And my thing has always been my, my family. It's never been personal to, personal to me. It's all about my family. <laughs> it's about my family. But I'm just, but that's just me. I don't know about anybody else. So I'm creating, I'm creating, I have created a place and space that has gone beyond just me. Thank you. Thank you. And thank all of our speakers tonight. I think um, this provided a really comprehensive view um, of, of the importance of whether we call it participatory action research resident researchers, community science, citizen science, we'll go back into the classroom and discuss these things. But thank you all for your time and for your years of uh, dedicated work. Before we leave, Joan, I want you to really, I want you also to understand, I had no idea about community participatory research until I just dived in. I mean, dived in onto the yeah. deep end and I don't, and I had to learn how to swim. Great. Okay, thank you again. Um, for those of you in the intro class, we'll take a 10 minute break and then go back into the Zoom from Canvas. Okay, thanks again. I'm for, I, I, and I'm looking for everybody to contact me for information. Okay, I will give them your coordinates. Thank you. Thank you all, bye-bye.